All right. Welcome everybody to the second edition of the spring speaker series of 2021 Maryville University. Um, we are pleased to have Jonathan talk here. He's a Maryville graduate and he works at spear tip. Um, he's an incident responder security analyst doing some great work. Uh, we'd love to hear what he has to say. He's also got some great experience um, bringing people into the field. So uh, we're looking forward to the amazing experience he has to share with us. Jonathan, take it away. Yeah, Sean, appreciate it. So yeah, as mentioned, Jonathan talking, I'm a director of security operations at Speartip. So uh, what that means is, is very much, um, you know, in, in my day to day role is uh, basically around delivery from a number of different services. So we uh, instant response, we're very much an instant response firm that focuses on uh, responding to everything from ransomware to wire fraud to uh, business email compromise. And I'll talk through a few, uh, a few different ones that I've been involved in that Speartip's been in involved in here in the next slide. Um, and then on top of instant response, we also do manage detection response where we're monitoring partners on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, monitoring for, um, you know, stopping malware in the environment, reviewing logs, threat hunting, and a number of different things in that. And then uh, lastly, we do a number of uh, offensive security assessments and penetration testing, vulnerability scanning, um, all, all based around our Shadow Spear platform. So can, can everyone see my screen? I probably should have asked as I start rambling. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Good stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I have slides. Please ask questions as, as I go through things, um, as, as I uh, tell stories, as I get into technical things, I tend to just keep talking. So, uh, you know, please ask questions and stop me or if there's something that I say that, uh, you know, anyone wants more information around, we'll definitely get into things. Um, but, but again, yeah, really, you know, my experience comes from uh, working in the incident response field. Uh, Speartip is, is approved on a number of the major insurance carriers. A large part of our, our work uh, comes from insurance related um, claims. So people having ransomware events, people having security events of some sort, uh, security incidents, and then managing that from a forensics perspective. Uh, we also have stood up in the last six months, a full IT remediation team. Um, so somewhat overnight, we, uh, you know, we had to, to get a number of people on the IT MSP side of things to, to get things rolling and, and be able to not only respond forensically to these engagements, but be able to set people up and, and get going. And then uh, we also perform uh, decryption services. So the negotiation with threat actors, paying ransoms um, in, in the event that that has to happen. Obviously, we go through every single check and process that we can to not have to do that. But there are, are times when a uh, company's hands are tied and they end up you know, having to pay a ransom to get their data decrypted or get their data back. And we assist in the facilitation of that um, you know, when legal, whenever they do so. And so to kind of get started, I just want to talk a little bit about more about my experience, uh, Spear Tips experience, what, what we do in the field. And uh, these are our five case studies that, that Spear Tips has been a part of. Um, so kind of from, from I'll, I'll explain a little bit about them, uh, war stories, so to speak, from left to right. Um, uh, on the far left there, that was actually a, a wire transfer case where a, a adversary out of China had stolen about $5 million um, over wire fraud transfers. Uh, we were able to to essentially, and, and that was through a business email compromise. So compromise business email was able to fraudulently, fraudulently get a user to essentially send $5 million um, overnight um, to a, a bank and then and then get that transferred again to China. Uh, it, it was a pretty large investigation where we were able to actually identify five different actors that were related um, to this case. So identify the actual person uh, and, and the five people in those cases and basically uh, we were able to get two and a half million dollars of the five million recovered, uh, which which is is very uncommon. So something that again our, our firm kind of specializes in is is not just the technology, and and you'll hear this a little bit as I go through these examples, not just the technology, um, but the people behind it. So technology does a great job of identifying malware, does a great job sometimes of uh, identifying you know, anomalies, things like that. But the people are uh, behind the technology and the operations center behind the technology is what really uh, you know is is able to. Elevate elevate you to the point of having a person uh, behind that. And so we were able to basically give all of our findings to the FBI Secret Service in this case, just the FBI, um, and, and essentially give that that blue folder, so to speak, to them so that they could uh, indict the actual uh, group that was behind this. Um, that was a picture that that one of our, our employees took when, when actually in the, uh, in the PR. 
ERC and, and getting that data. So um, that's that's an older case, a little bit newer case. Um, and the second one is a, a Romanian group that um, was actually actually hit a small uh, financial firm with with malware at the time uh, and was able to essentially was was hitting them consistently with malware uh continue to to and, and malware and ransomware and we'll talk a little bit about this as i kind of go but it's changed dramatically over the last three four five years um in this case um you know we were able to collect a quite a bit of information on the group we we're able to identify two people um, out of romania and in this case they were both actually arrested for the um the forced hacking uh did about 18 months in in federal prison for that um uh, but we're we're, uh, we're actually stealing everything from businesses to um, actually stealing even uh, trying to basically trying to get into NASA related files had compromised a few third party groups that, that had files related to NASA, um, but we're able to, uh, you know, give again, give all of that data to the FBI, get two people arrested in that. Uh, the middle one you may recognize um, as, as Sergey Bo Sergei Bodichev. Um, in that case, we actually had a financial firm out of St. Louis um, that we were able to essentially, uh, they got hit with cry debts. We were able to take that from uh, the initial, essentially the initial hit, the initial um, attempted recovery of, of, of information and unauthorized remote access, and basically take that um, and, and again, just build that information uh, around what happened in that case. Um, and unfortunately for, for Bodachev, he, he was not using a, any type of Tor browser or hiding his IP in any way or, or um, you know, trying to hide exactly where he was coming from. So we were able to get quite a bit of information and again, you know, add to that folder in that case of, uh, of giving that to uh, giving that to, to the FBI and, and, you know, giving more information that led ultimately to his indictment. Uh, the fourth one, another group out of St. Louis, actually. So um, in this case, it was an anonymous member or a wannabe anonymous member. So uh, criminal organizations very much have a hierarchy. So in this case, he was trying to uh, to try out for that group and uh, was 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 getting into quite a quite a few different SQL servers. Um, was was trying to to pull data, mine data, and then essentially use that as as his tryout, so to speak, for anonymous. Um, you know, we're we're able to again. Uh, pull information on him, uh, give a, a nice, you know, number of IPs, number of data to the uh, to the FBI Secret Service, and, and he also did about 18 months um, in, in federal prison, 15 to 18 months in federal prison, um, regarding that that insider threat and that information that, that he stole. Um, and then finally, uh, the guy all the way on the far right is the Dark Overlord. Um, so we actually had a number of cases that that we had built a case around this individual, um, where we, again kind of sloppy uh, in letting information fall out, letting information you know come uh, basically not having Tor browser, not not uh, in any way kind of hiding that IP, um, and something that we were able to actually get a home address and and get some some data around him. Um, arrested for about three years this time in, in prison than him, but uh, he was building malware, building cyber extortion tools and then implementing those in client systems. Um, so again, oh, let me go back here. So again, you know, just, just kind of a, a little bit up here and what are we talking about when we say instant response? I think a lot of times people think instant response and they immediately think ransomware and that's a big part of instant response is responding to ransomware events, but it, it it's a whole number of things. It's everything from insider threats uh, to business email compromise to rogue IT. We we've worked you know a number of investigations where you have someone that's internal IT that's been there for ten years that you know decides one day that he wants to start stealing uh, either stealing data or stealing money from the company or thinks that he's owed something from the company. We've worked a number of those types of investigation and instant response really is 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 all of them. So it's it's all of those pieces. It could potentially be be any any one of those, you know, um, all, all the way up the chain. And it's everything from five to ten thousand dollars to, you know, in, in some cases we worked last year, you know, multi million dollar ransomware uh, groups that that were expecting multi million dollar payouts on on the their actual ransom. So uh, really, have have seen kind of the the whole slew of of different engagements and and different uh, uh, different types of of incidents. So before I move on, any any questions about any of this or or questions just kind of about incident response in general? All right. 
So just to, uh, to break down a little bit more um, of, of instant response and, and kind of what, what Speartip does, what's, what some of those goals are, I kind of mentioned it already, uh, a big part of instant response that we perform or the piece that we perform is data breach investigation. Um, that's the forensics, that's actually going in and, and taking images, uh, trying to peer into what happened. Uh, I always say answering the five W's, you know, who, what, when, where, why, um, who, who got in, what did they do when they were in there? Where did they where did they come in or where did they go once they had access? Why were they in? Was it financial motivation? Was it to steal data? Um, was it you know financial motivation and to steal data, which we see a number of times, um, and really answer all those questions. And and the goal for Spear Tips, something to, to mention, you know, the goal of any forensics firm when it comes to instant response is to get to the point of what's the likelihood answer all those questions that I mentioned, but really answer what's the likelihood of, of information having been, been stolen? Because that's when you start getting into a, a whole number of things like uh, like with, with HIPAA or with different regulations where you have to notify certain people because of that breach. Um, and, and obviously as a company, they're trying to limit those notification obligations to, to the best of their legal ability when, when something like this happens. And so we're assisting them to try to uh, essentially help that, that get them that answer. Was data stolen? Do we have proof that it was stolen? Do we know how long the, the breach occurred? Uh, what was the dwell time? That's typically the, the phrase used in incident response, meaning how long did a bad guy sit in this environment before initiating a ransom or before people noticed? Um, IT remediation, pretty straightforward, setting the, the uh, business back up, getting things back up and running. That's typically around ransomware. Um, when ransomware does happen, you know, making sure that everything is back up, that people are able to get to their files, um, and then decryption services. And this is really just a very small piece that Speartip falls in of the whole instant response life cycle. So, um, we don't provide any legal services. That's a big part of, of instant response. And we'll touch on it a little bit, I believe, in, a, in either next slide or the slide after it. But we don't provide legal services. Um, that's something that typically an outside breach council will always be involved in an instant response. Or or I should, I should say, should always be involved in an instant response. And the reason being is that they're providing guidance, one. So they're, you know, saying, hey, this is what we should tell our clients. This is what we should tell the in, the people that work for your company. This is what we should tell outside vendors or outside partners about what happened. And, and that's really important. Um, they also actually keep everything privileged. Um, and what that means is that it, to some degree, they're able to cloak, cloak all of the information that's being talked about in privilege. And why that's so important, and again, we'll talk about this in a minute, but why that's so important is just the ability for information to not get out surrounding a, a, a data breach because that's when something goes from a small investigation to you know ballooning up into a, a, a much larger problem. Uh, we also don't provide any types of communication or crisis communication services. It's another big part of instant response. I have a number of friends that graduated from Maryville that are in IT security that are on more of the crisis communication side. So uh, I, I guess just to, to kind of put it all in is there's a number of different paths. If, if you're interested in incident response, if you're interested in kind of that immediate break fits, big problems, you know, uh, being being in, in a number of, of different situations that make the news. I mean, uh, on, on average, a large majority of, of data breaches, you know, will, will garnish some type of headlines and, and things going on. There's just a number of different paths you can go down from that crisis communication, decryption services, IT remediation, data breach investigation, um, and, and obviously the legal route. So uh, a number of attorneys, even here in St. Louis, have uh, entire sectors that are, are built around, you know, data privacy and, and data breach uh, mitigation. So just a lot of different different paths that you can go down and a lot of different things to think about when it comes to incident response. I like this slide. It's a little hard to see. Um, I probably could have, could have pulled better, but, uh, you know, when, when trying to define what is a cybersecurity incident, I, I pulled three different URLs, three different websites, uh, they gave me three completely different answers. So the NCSC uh, defines it as, as X. Uh, you'll see here the definition of a cyber incident uh, based on another government site, uh, you know, defines it as unauthorized entry, security breach, unauthorized scan or probe, denial of service. Um, and, and then uh, this third side of law insider, the legal definition of, of a cybersecurity incident um, is completely different. So I, I think the important part or the, the part, the reason I bring this up or the reason I, I wanted to talk about it is uh, a cyber security incident is is not a standard definition. There's not one thing that's that's the end all be all. This is what a cyber security incident is. And, and the reason being is that it depends on the company that's experiencing the problem, right? Amazon Web Services, 
uh, having a security incident is, is very different than, uh, you know, the, the company down the, the restaurant down the street that hosts their menu on, uh, you know, on a website page, they, they have a very a much smaller risk surface. Uh, they also, you know, it would, it would detail an incident as something completely different. AWS probably has a number of different categories of, of what an incident is all the way from, you know, initial uh, security event up through a true incident where they're uh, talking about their incident response plan and how they, they deal with that. And, um, and it's important just to know that, that a cybersecurity incident, there, there's no way that you can bullet point every single incident. And I think for my, my experience has been much that where we've worked on everything from uh, text message going out to an entire, um, an entire zip code area stating that a bank server had been compromised to uh, you know, ransomware over in, uh, in Switzerland where they, they were able to essentially you know, take, it, take personal action on, on people potentially liable. And so security, uh, cybersecurity incident is just such a broad, uh, broad piece of what's going on and, and, and a, kind of what that is in, in general. Jonathan, um, I have a question about that. Yeah, absolutely. So does that make the job of incident responders more difficult or does that make it less difficult? Like I'm thinking, so it could make it more difficult because you have to be able to, you know, able to respond to basically the unknown or it could be be you know easier because you're able to be flexible in your response yeah and no it, it definitely makes it it definitely makes it more difficult i would say than than less difficult i mean uh even in the incident response world if i looked at some of the major incident response companies out there and then the different players in the space they, they all have different it doesn't matter if you go as large as crowdstrike um, you know, or, or small as a local IT MSP, they, they all have different capabilities and different, uh, you know, strengths and weaknesses. And, and that's what makes it so difficult because there are so many different types. Uh, spear tip, I would say a large percentage of our, our cases are, are ransomware cases. And so we, we very much excel at dealing with ransomware. We very much excel at dealing with business email compromise because, uh, you know, four out of every five, and I, I don't know the exact statistic of, of how many, but a large majority of them are fall into one of those two categories. So we've gotten very good. We're very profound in it. Um, now we have members on our team that have, uh, you know, GPEN, SANS GPEN certifications and have web application certifications and, and AWS and Azure. And so, uh, you know, not to say that if someone came to us and had a website compromise that it, we want to be able to handle it and, and deal with it from a security perspective, but it does make it more difficult. You have to then think, you know, about having those skill sets on the team to deal with those one-offs and, and deal with things that maybe don't fall into the standard. Um, and that's again kind of to go back to where I started. It's why you can't just have a tool to deal with with cybersecurity, and you can't just have a tool that does incident response. It it has to be the people behind it and the skill level, the skill set of the people that are running those tools, that are collecting the information, that are actually performing the action. Because reviewing web application logs and reviewing host system logs, it's not that different. But you do have to know the subtle differences that would lead you to okay, I'm going to go down this rabbit hole and figure out if this was Cobalt Strike on an endpoint versus a JavaScript file that was pulling, uh, you know, cash credit card credentials. So it's it's not that it's that much different, but you do have to have skill levels, and and it's the reason that we have an operations center. We have a number of different people that have different things that they're good at because you can't have one person that's just going to be able to knock every cybersecurity incident out. Gotcha. Thank you. Great kind of law and form, uh, law and form answer to, uh, to your question. It was great. It was great. It was, there is, there is so many intricacies in, in, in how you respond. So, um, you know, I appreciate you laying that out. Yeah. Um, what, one thing I do want to note too, is, is what's not a cybersecurity incident. Um, you know, there, one thing that's really important and it, and it is important no matter where any of you, uh, you know, end up in, in your cybersecurity career is that, uh, when it comes to a cybersecurity incident from a risk perspective, from a company perspective, um, you have to very much treat everything like a security event until you've got to the point of, of having an incident. And, and where the difference there is, is I'll, I'll, I'll kind of explain it in, in more basic terms, is that if a log comes in and it shows that someone successfully accessed a computer uh, from China, let's say uh, log or initial IP is China, access a machine and your company doesn't have any resources in China. So that's something that that's a security event that happened. You're looking into it. You notice that, okay, this 
uh, when they got in, they elevated their privileges to domain administrator. They were able to uh, pull a number of different pieces in the environment. Maybe they dropped malware, maybe they tried to pull files. Um, all of those in and of themselves are, are security events. They're all data that maybe is, is leading you for your, your company's policy to, to start that incident response plan and consider it an incident at some stage in that policy. Um, but the key is, it, it, no matter where you end up, is making sure that you're managing communication and your when it comes to cybersecurity incidents, you want to document as, as well as you can and you want a number, you know, as much documentation as you can get, but you can say the wrong things and you can put the wrong things in communication. Um, and that's so important in an incident response plan. We're going to step through the stages of an incident, um, you know, after I get through this, but it's extremely important in an incident response plan that you that you are communicating effectively and not always writing every little communication down. So uh, not only is using email potentially dangerous because if your email got compromised, you would be you all would be shocked at how many times someone's emailing me, letting me know that their email got compromised. Not a good situation if your email is potentially compromised. Don't use that as a form of communication. Have backups, have different things that you can use. Um, text messages, you know, whatever that is. Um, and, and second point is, there is such things as, as, you know, legal definitions that you just have to be really careful around. It's the reason that people pay spear tip and, and pay law firms and pay, uh, you know, communication firms to, to work these cases is saying things like, hey, boss, I looked at this server from the Chinese IP, IP and I'm pretty sure we had a breach. Uh, a breach is a legal definition that's determined by a law firm. It's not something that you want to just throw around, you know, that wording willy nilly. And the reason being is that in a lot of legislation and a lot of different compliance factors, a breach starts your clock that you now have to notify within a specific amount of time. And that's just one definition among, uh, you know, a, a number of things that you just really want to go through that process and, and know what you're saying. And again, have a plan, have an instant response plan that uh, that you're using and that you're you're working towards. And this really goes to the next slide. I, I always love the image of trying to hammer a square peg into a round hole. Uh, an incident response plan for a company, as I mentioned, like a restaurant down the street um, or a 50 to 100 person company versus a Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000, you know, a, a company that, that's much bigger and, and larger. You have to scale that incident response plan. You have to scale the steps to that specific company. Nothing's going to work for the small company that works for the next one up. And, and that's true, just an instant response in general, you know, isolating the host whenever you see something unusual on it may work at a small company. Uh, a large company may actually have millions of dollars that they're losing for every minute or every hour that that host is turned off that, that doesn't necessarily fit. So uh, wherever, wherever you all end up, you know, in, in your journey and in, in your, your cybersecurity career, just know that just because it works at, at a company you were at before, just because you found a, a, you know, an article online that says this is how you should conduct your incident response plan, it, it needs to be scalable and it needs to be fit for your organization. If your organization is very email heavy and, you know, you, and they want to use email to uh, deal with an incident, that, that might be okay, but you have to realize when email is down or if the email server is down or Office 365 has one of it, it's 35 incidents a month where it's randomly not working or it's bouncing back emails or whatever's going on. You have to have a plan for that scalability and you have to have a backup plan. Uh, and sometimes a backup plan to your backup plan when it comes to communications. And that needs to scale up and down with the organization. And so now I'm going to go through just kind of the different stages of an incident response plan. Um, I very much, I'm a, I'm a huge SANS guy. I love the SANS certification, SANS test. So this is actually pulled from SANS uh, certified incident handler um, test and, and their material. And what it, what it is, is the different steps that you should be taking uh, kind of at a high level, the different steps that every organization should be thinking of when it comes to incident response, IT remediation, um, all of the pieces of dealing with an incident. So kind of starting with preparation. The, the best time to be thinking about an incident is before one occurs. Uh, if you've never thought about what happens if all of your computers go down at a company, you know, if you're in an executive position, if you never thought about what that means for the company or how you continue moving forward, how you make money, what the cost is, um, then you're gonna learn very quickly once an incident occurs, all of those, those pieces. So uh, preparation is, is your policy that you have, you know, policy to deal with how users should be, especially now in, in the COVID world of uh, what is your, your policy around remote work? What's your policy around working from home? Can, uh, can clients or, or can 
your users use personal computers at home. I mean, that's that's all things that potentially are related to uh, higher risk for the environment, and, and it needs to be in that instant response preparation. Because if you do allow your your remote users to use their personal computer, you're going to have a really hard time forcing them to give you that computer for analysis. Um, you know, if you do have some type of event that came from their computer. So, uh, and most companies don't let you use personal computers, but just as an example of why that preparation. So it's uh, critical. We've talked a lot about the incident response plan already. Very important to have an incident response plan in place. Know everyone, and, and the incident response plan should not be something you keep on your computer uh, because when it's ransomed, it, it doesn't really do you much good. Uh, you need it printed out. You need you know uh, something to actually hand to people, not just print it out on your C drive or uh, you know on your C drive of your computer. That's a bad plan. Communication response plan, I talked about if you don't have email, what do you go to? What's your phone tree? Who are you calling? Who are you not calling? That's almost more important because for a large majority of incidents, everyone in your organization does not need to know about it. And why that's important is that loose lips sink ships. I mean, I think that's more true in incident response than anywhere where if you, the more people that know, the more people that are going to tell other people, they're going to tell their wife who tells their friend who tells someone else. Um, and, and it's all about those, those people tell their husband who, who happens to work at a news firm who happens to also tell someone else that, Hey, this corporation might've had an attack that they haven't talked about yet keeping that that circle tight in an organization about who needs to know who needs all the details um, even sometimes in a security team if you have an issue where one of the security team members is, is maybe uh, part of that incident you don't want to post in your normal incident response board that you know Joe Schmo, Schmo is is related to potentially having stolen data um, so having that communication re response plan, having fallbacks, having different ways that you can uh, communicate effectively so that you're not emailing, you know, the word breach and, and different things around is, is extremely important. Um, vendor management, preparation around vendor management is, is very rarely done and very few organizations properly do it. But is there a, a you know, a number of, of companies have a actually have to tell their clients, have to tell their vendors within a certain amount of, of time if, if they've been ransomed, if they've been hit by an attack and, and knowing and who you have to reach out to, who that is, you know, who those vendors are, potentially uh, where your data is. And that's the most important part. Where's my data stored? If I'm using, uh, you know, Sean and I were talking about AWS and using uh, AWS for um, the the digital forensics class, which which I'm an adjunct and I teach at Maryville. I teach ISYS uh, 475, I think is what Sean said it was, uh, digital forensics. And, um, but but now we're putting that data now, obviously in the class, it's not it's not data that, that potentially get, gets stolen or whatever, but AWS is holding that data. So if AWS has a breach and we potentially were using that for student data, social security numbers or information like that, there's an obligation that we would expect from them that they would have to tell us, that they would have to make us aware. And, and, and in all their contracts, they say how they would do that. Uh, a lot of times it's an obscure, not for AWS specifically, but an obscure website page that no one goes to and they don't have to promote. And, you know, they, there's just poor vendor management and, and kind of client communication all around in the preparation piece, but know where your data lives. That's the, the end all be all. Know where that data is, is living so that when you have an incident, you can also say, well, actually, we just moved all of the data to AWS. So I don't have to worry now about, um, about my, my internal data getting encrypted. Did someone have a question? Um, and then preparation is training. So an, another just key component of, of preparing for an incident is proper training, um, having the, the right pieces in place, having people that have security training on your teams, um, taking certifications yourself. Obviously you are all are in school. You understand the importance of education. You understand how, how certifications can obviously land you jobs, but they're also how you get better and how you make your organizations better uh, once you get there. Uh, the second one here is identification. Um, average attack dwell time, according to an info site, and I, I cited it there, but according to an info site um, study, which looked at, I believe, about 30,000 incidents, um, the average dwell time, time between an attacker penetrating a network defense and being discovered, ranged from 43 to 895 days. So that's what, almost three years, uh, two and a half years for SM for small medium sized businesses the report found and the average dwell time for confirmed persistent malware was 798 days uh, 
that's awful. So that, that if that if there's one role that we as you know the, as the next generation of uh, uh, security pros and security researchers and and security fanatics should have, it's to get that average dwell time down of how long malware can live in an environment before we identify it. Um, malware is is not always easy to find, as we obviously uh, all saw with the solar winds breach recently um you know we, we had malware that was being pushed through updates uh you know that that initial access through an update it was a confirmed signed update by the company it, it's not always easy um but average dwell time of, of you know 798 days is just ridiculous with the amount of tools and the amount of not only the amount of tools that are paid for tools but the amount of open source free available threat hunting tools um here i just showed uh, you know real quickly process explorer uh, this is an ELT stack search filter or pivot rule. Um, you know, open source tools that you can find these types of things. Not only can you find these types of things, but open source tools that will teach all of you, you know, as you get into different things. If I did look back and, and there's one thing that I, you know, during uh, my time at Maryville um, would have gotten more into, it's getting more into GitHub, getting more into open source tools, learning just uh, better ways around how to dig into malware, threat hunting an environment, you know, building, building those types of things that they're already publicly available. Um, but that's how we, as we get better at those things, that's how we get this average dwell time down and, and just work better to not let malware. I mean, think about the amount of data that you can collect in almost 800 days. Um, at that point, they, they've got everything. They've got your last pass credentials. They've got every, you know, credit card you've used. Um, I, I hear all the time and, and, and you guys will, will all know once you work in cybersecurity, uh, everyone wants to ask you questions, personal questions about cybersecurity. And I hear all the time, uh, I keep getting my, you know, my credit card stolen. What uh, monitoring should I, you know, uh, look into? And, and, and monitoring may help, but you also may have malware sitting on your computer. You know, what, what are you using to make purchases? Are, are, have you changed your credit card? If you have changed it, are you using the same computer over and over? So, um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things, but in general, identification during incident response is about IDing what's going on in the, in, in the incident and identification in, in, in totality. So being able to say, okay, we have 16 machines. Uh, Marriott's a great example of what not to do during the identification phase. If you look back into their breach, uh, probably about 12 months ago, maybe 18 months ago now, they they told essentially they continue to update the number of how many records had been potentially compromised and what that led to was just a complete mistrust or complete lack of trust in in marriott to give actionable and give real data because they weren't doing a good job of identifying what actually was hit and when they did identify what was hit they didn't know how much data was actually in those places um so identification is just a critical part in in the instant response you know piece and it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, you've got sometimes terabytes and terabytes of data that you have to sit through, that you have to mine through. It doesn't happen all of a sudden, um, but it does It does have to happen quickly and it, it is an important part in, in just that life cycle. Uh, Jonathan, one of the, um, I watched a, uh, a webinar today, uh, a we or like a web webinar training class from Active Countermeasures today. And they mentioned the same thing with, you know, it's about almost over, sometimes even like over 800 days. And you know, I think you said 793 uh, um, uh, of just malware, just they're sitting on the sitting, sitting on their systems going undetected. And, uh, you know, we're one of the big things they were talking about is, you know, we're past the days of writing signatures and, you know, hoping for the best. It's you have to be out there actively looking for threats, looking for beaconing data. Um, you know, you're actively searching, you know, threat hunting teams are more important now than ever. Um, because, you know, as soon as the signature is written, the, 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 mal the malicious actor is, uh, you know, they go, they go and change, they go and change the way that they're, you know, they go change the IP address that they're beaconing to, or they, you know, they go change, you know, whatever, um, you know, the signature data that, you know, that, that you wrote. And a lot of times, you know, especially with all this information sharing, um, you know, you, the malicious actors know just as fast as as the you know the ethical actors um what what the new signatures are so they find out and they boom they change it and then now your signature doesn't work so it's you really have to be active out there um, yeah in threat hunting 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll even talk to that. So something uh, we came across, and I, I don't know if we wrote a blog about it or if it's hit more, but regardless, uh, Sunburst malware was actually querying for security tools or if it found a FireEye endpoint agent, if it found a CrowdStrike endpoint agent, if it found Wireshark running on the host, it just slept so that they could hit the machines in the environment that didn't have those tools on it because there's always one or two that it misses. And then they would run on those machines and not worry about the ones that uh, had the EDR tools on it. And it's a cat and mouse game. That's the way I, I heard that during a B-Sides conference about two years ago where it's a cat and mouse game where we get better, they get better. We get better, they get better. And so we- I think I was I at that B-Sides. What? I think I was at that B-Sides. I remember that talk. Yeah, yeah. I think it was two, two years ago, back when we all used to be able to get together and actually talk about yeah. cool security stuff. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was, uh, I forget the guy's name, but he's, he's, uh, the hack the car guy. Um, ah, oh, shoot. I'll have to find his name, but, um, yeah, yeah it, it's that constant, you know, uh, getting better, they get better, we get better, they get better. And, uh, and threat hunting is the next logical step there where we have to look for abnormalities outside of just a, a hash, outside of just EDR tools even of, of saying, okay, this is the first time that this machine has ever talked to this URL or talked to this IP. Maybe we should figure out what's living there. So uh, continue right. to question things. I mean, that's how you're successful in the managed detection response in the security world is continue to question things. If you get the same alert twice, ask why I got this alert twice. Is it a bad rule? Is it something actually going on? So yeah, I think that's okay. absolutely Sean. Yeah. Um, and and obviously that's the next one is containment. What is a uh, a good presentation in 2021 without at least one picture of uh, of the coronavirus there. Um, again, containment is, is containing the threat. So if you do have ransomware that, again, like we just mentioned, if we're talking about two machines that have ransomware running on them or, or have Sunburst malware running on them, how are you containing those? How are you putting them behind, uh, you know, behind bars, so to speak, so that they can't talk out? Isolated to only talking to specific machines. Isolated from talking to other machines on the network, because just talking out over the internet is not enough. Um, you know, isolating that machine fully and not allowing it to talk to other things, containing that piece. And then also on the business side, containment of information. I talked about it already, but uh, the more people that know, the quicker it's going to get to Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, I think that's the WhatsApp logo. Um, Regardless, it's, it's all about containing both the message and making sure that your your company is the first one to get the message out. You're you're drawing the message. You're actually the one that's saying, okay, this is the uh, how this data should be presented and how we want to present it. It's an accurate message, but it's also not giving too much data away if we haven't confirmed it yet. Um, and just containing that overall uh, overall discussion. Uh, Next one is, is eradication. It's eradicating the threat and, and actually removing it from the environment. So in ransomware's case, that's making sure that we're pulling from good images. Uh, there's a number of times that someone's called Speartip and said, hey, we think we have malware. We're pretty sure we have it under control. Um, you know, how much does it cost to have you guys come in and tell us how it happened and all of that? And uh, it's too much, you know, too expensive, which I understand. It's, it's very much a immediate response uh, type business. So it's not cheap to be in a, an instant responder, an instant response world. Um, but then two weeks later, they call us and they're like, hey, uh, we're encrypted again. Um, and, and a lot of times it's because they're rolling back to bad backups. They didn't know how long. We just talked about, you know, the two year dwell time. They didn't know that the bad actor, I mean, they they're rolling back to a backup that he had access on, uh, didn't change passwords. So his password's still good to go. Really didn't even slow down the stride of the bad actor. Um, and, and so, or they still had RDP open, for example, they still had a, a vulnerable firewall, whatever the initial thing is, uh, eradication is removing all of that so that you can actually come back to clean. You can come back to new, you, you've got good data. Uh, it's not as common now, thankfully, uh, about two years ago, you would constantly see threat actors. They thought it was hilarious uh, or, or whatever, you know, they're, they're thinking behind it, but you constantly see them send a decryptor that had malware in it. So you would decrypt your files and then it would put malware on, on your system so that it, they could decide to ransom you again, or they could just sit there and listen. Um, you don't see it as much now. It's much more likely to see the, uh, you know, the double ransom side of things where they make you pay your ransom and then they also make you pay if you don't want your data leaked. That's kind of the MO for Q4 of 2020. Uh, 2021 is, is a little bit of a mixed bag so far, but uh, 2020 was very much the, uh, okay, we're going to release your data if you don't pay us an X amount of time. 
and and you have to pay for it to get this decryptor. But either way, the the eradication piece is so important where you're going back to a good backup. You're not going back to you know a, another bad backup and making sure that that's done effectively. And we've talked about this a few times, you know, recovery, it, it's so important to recover systems um, and to get things back up and running, get things back up and running quickly. Uh, the average IT team, if you ask them how long it takes to restore from backups, their answer is, we, we have no idea. We've never had to do a full restore of every system. Um, but that's something that should be documented in the instant response plan. If you're making a million dollars an hour uh, from your website, you should know that that, that website re restoration, if you had to completely restore, if it was completely down, takes three days. And the reason that's so important is if you're, you as a business team member are deciding between paying a ransom or waiting for the recovery, you should know it's going to take three days to pay the rent or to recover it. It's going to take probably five to 10 days to actually get it decrypted and get the, uh, the ransom paid. Most of the time getting the ransom paid actually takes a lot longer than recovering. Every situation is a little different. If you don't have backups, if you can't recover, um, you know, then that's not an option. Um, but again, the recovery piece, it's all, all goes back to preparation, knowing what's going on, but recovering to those good backups, having offsite backups. Uh, I'm not a backup expert by any means, but have something that you, uh, you know, is constantly available, have a full backup at least, you know, every, every few weeks that's offsite. And that's away from the, the system just to make sure that, uh, you know, you're, you're not getting it, getting hit and, and that sort of thing's not happening to you. And then really uh, my last slide here, the most important and most overlooked part of incident response and, and really of a lot of just life lessons is, uh, or, or you know, things that we all go through in life is stopping for a second and thinking about lessons learned. Okay, what did we do well? How did things work really, really well? Where did things go poorly? Why did uh, the secretary know about this incident You know, on day two, according to our incident response plan, it should have just been these three people or it should have just been this group. Um, and, and if you don't go back to this, you're, you're bound to repeat yourself. You're gonna have another security incident. You're gonna have something else happen. Um, you know, If we would have had endpoint detection response in place, we wouldn't have had this ever happen. The malware wouldn't have been able to hit us. Okay. That's fine. Let's implement uh, EDR. If you're not deploying it to every single system, you didn't really learn anything. You, you just deployed a new tool that is still not working on, on your entire environment. If you know you don't have a better communication plan the second time, uh, so that you're not sending emails, you didn't learn anything. You know, so it's all about taking a, a step back, thinking about okay, how can I apply the lessons that that we understood and and really push that into uh, in, into you know future problems, change, upgrade the instant response plan, print it out this time instead of having it, doing a tabletop where you actually review the incident response plan and go through a potential issue, you know, all of those things and, and uh, pieces that just so often get forgotten. Um, but it's also the reasons that companies like Walmart, you don't hear every day about getting breaches, AWS, they're constantly evaluating lessons learned and, uh, and, and constantly you know, thinking about how we could have done better how we could have uh, performed better in, in these different situations. So um, that's really, really everything I had on the incident response and, and just in, how to deal with an incident, the typical incident response life cycle. Uh, I promise I would talk a little bit about uh, jobs at Speartip and just jobs overall, um, you know, in, in the industry. And so uh, Speartip, you know, we're, we're always looking for people. Uh, we're always looking for security analysts. We run at this point, we run five different shifts. So we have, uh, we're 24 seven. So we have night shift, we have a second shift. Uh, we actually have two second shifts where we're mostly, for the most part, any odd shift is a four day work week. So you work four tens instead of uh, a five eights. Uh, we also have a weekend shift that just works over the weekend and there's different, uh, you know, there's different bonuses, so to speak, for, for the different shifts and, and uh, salary bumps and things of that nature. But um, always looking for people. Best way to apply is info at speartip.com. Um, and Sean made a really good uh, good point that I wanted to, to bring up earlier as well is that, you know, I think in, in college, you're constantly thinking like, what tools do I need to be an expert at? And, and to some degree, you're kind of chasing a, a rabbit that you're never going to catch, right? I, I and, and everyone's different. So don't don't take my advice over, over maybe what you heard from other people, you know, just think about all of this. For me personally, seeing 36 tools on a resume, 
uh, is a lot less interesting than seeing, hey, here's this program that I contributed on GitHub or on, on uh, yeah, on GitHub. And here's this, uh, this program that I helped with. Here's my, my GitHub page. Here's uh, a CTF that I joined or that I was a part of. I'm a B-Sides member. I'm engaged in the cybersecurity community because those are all things that show passion uh, beyond just, okay, I, I can do, I can do the job that you present yourselves. And spear tip, especially we're, we're going to teach just about anyone how to get to the level, uh, that they need to be at from a technical capability, but they very much have to want and love cybersecurity to be successful. They have to, you know, be an organized person, but they have to love the, just that idea of looking for things. I mean, we have a number of engagements where you're looking for things that are abstract. You're not, you know, it's not as easy as running a search and getting the answer. It's both thinking about the right question and knowing what you're looking for. So those are all things that, that can be taught. What can't be taught is just that drive, that love for cybersecurity. And, and it's gonna teach you too, what you like to do. So by being involved in B-sides, being involved in Capture the Flags, you're gonna find very quickly, do I like the instant response side? Do I like the red team side? Uh, or, or do I not really like any of them? And, and I like public speaking, I like teaching. Um, you know, me, I, I've, I've talked at a, at a number of events. I talk at conferences all the time. It's a big part of cybersecurity. I like to, uh, you know, teach and I like to, to bring other people into it. But there's just so many, I guess my point is there's so many different roles that you can get in. The more engaged you get while you have more time and you have, uh, you know, less risk um, for some of you, if you don't have uh, bills to pay and, and you know, necessarily a, a family and all, all of those pieces is that you're able to, you know, take those risks, learn those things things. And that's what really, I think, shines when we're looking at an applicant pool of people do who just go above and beyond in those ways, um, or, or just do a really good job of, of kind of selling the intangibles of, of just loving cybersecurity, wanting to be engaged. Um, I went to DEF CON, uh, not last year because they didn't have it last year, but the year before. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's one of those things where you very quickly will learn uh, if, if you like security or not, because they're getting very in depth, they're getting into the technical ones and twos. But even at the the largest, you know, arguably the largest hacking conference in the world, there there's still people that are talking about the basics. They're still talking about network penetration or uh, different ways to show blue team exercises. And so there's just a ton of different things you can do in cybersecurity, and there's really no wrong way. But uh, just spend the time to figure out what you want to do. And, and I guarantee there's a way, no matter what organization you get in, a way that you can put those skills um, you know, forward to really be, uh, you know, be successful. I just want to piggyback on what you said there. I think you know, it's, there's the, the huge, it's, I, 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 you know, some people say it's, oh, it's a fire hose of information you know, that you know, try to drink from it. But it, I'm, I think it's like 17 fire hoses of information that you got to try to drink from all at the same time. And, uh, there's just so much information out there, you know, looking at new tools. I have like 200 tabs open on my computer on Chrome of tools that I have yet to go through. Um, and I've already probably knocked out a couple hundred tabs. Um, and so it's, it, and it's like, I, I knock out one and then I open 20 new tabs and, and, so, and these are all tools, you know, GitHub repos, uh, you know, different like tutorial pages or, you know, walkthroughs and, um, you know, capture the flags, different, you know, virtual machines, uh, you know, all, all the, all the different, all different sorts of things. So there's just so much out there. Um, you have to be, you have to have that drive that you, that you want to learn more. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that goes to speak to exactly what you're, what you are looking for um, in candidates is that more than anything, more than the experience or the, you know, like the things that you've learned or the books you've read, the most important thing is that willingness and desire to like want to learn more and to, to be able to show that you know like you said is you know I, I, uh, you know how do you i think a thing that comes up very commonly in interviews is is how do you keep up with cyber mm -hmm. you know it, there's there's so many ways but just being able to talk about them um you know what do you do to do that uh, i think that's an answer that everybody should have ready uh, yeah, we so. we uh, we asked that question. How do you keep up with cyber news in every interview? And uh, you know, it's funny because people a lot of times don't want to talk about like Twitter or Reddit, and it's like Twitter and Reddit are are two major sources of cybersecurity news. I mean, it, it's yeah. not uh, you know it may not be Forbes magazine, but like if you legitimately want to know about 
malware and you love malware, it, you follow 20 to 30 different Twitter accounts and you will know, uh, you will know more than you could, you know, get your entire heart's content of leading yeah. and, and leading malware and, and stuff that's brand new. Sunburst was on Twitter for a week before, and it wasn't called Sunburst yet, but different indicators of compromise security researchers were on Reddit and Twitter weeks before Fire I posted about it. So like, uh, again, it, it's, yeah, it, it's just keep, you know, it's about finding what you really like and what you really enjoy doing. Because some people are, are not ones and zeros people that want to use P Studio and, and want to pull apart malware. And that's fine. There, there's other roles. Maybe you don't like, and, and you know, when I went through Maryville, there, the, all the thought was around red teaming and like being on the attack side. And, and I very much don't do any of that now. Uh, you know, but I thought at Maryville, like, that's what I wanted to do. It's super cool. Got into instant response and it's like, Oh my gosh, this is this is way cooler. We're doing instant response for Fortune 100 companies, and and you know, uh, just just doing things that, that are amazing, and 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 making the news, and and learning about things before it hits the news. And so, it's just about figuring out what what's those pieces that you like to do, and and then finding a role or finding a company that really matches that. Because, yeah, again, like I said earlier, every company has different skills, uh, different things that they do, and and then just get once you get that entry level position going as far as you, you can take every you know, questioning everything uh so that you understand why uh that you know this is the way you you break apart malware understanding why during an alert i'm looking into network you know attachments or, or whatever it may be yeah, i will say we have definitely expanded our operations at maryville um through since the time that you've graduated we've been through iterations of uh red teaming blue teaming um you know uh, we're getting into uh, purple teaming and what is it? Orange and green, <laughs> yellow, orange, green, all the, all the different colors. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, a lot of new things going on here. Um, and so we, we like to get people interested in. Well, and you have to, you have to be flexible. You have to be flexible because in reality, there, there's probably less than 20 red team positions in all of the state of Missouri. I mean, it, it's just the, the truth of the matter. Now, then people aren't, aren't, there's not a ton of companies looking for penetration testers because they're being replaced to some degree with Qualys scanners, with endpoint scanners, with, with things that, you know, they just don't need that high level penetration tester. The jobs are out there, but, but again, it's that flexibility that, uh, you know, no matter what you're really into, just, just to be the best at that, figure out everything you can about that. And, and, you know, you, you'll definitely find a position. We, we have people that love red team at spear tip. Like I said, it's not a big part of what we do. We do vulnerability scans. We do penetration testing. Um, but it's, it's the, the smaller percentage of our overall work. Um, but they can apply that to an instant response because they can think like an attacker and think about how that person got from point A to point B. They can, you know, you can apply it to a number of different roles. Yeah. Yeah, just like that cat, the cat and mouse game that you were that you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, definitely got to think like the think like the cat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think we're the cat, but some days I definitely feel like the mouse in security. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, especially like when you talk about Twitter, you know, these indicators of compromise are posted. The you know the people who are writing the malware they see, oh great, that indicator was was posted. I'm going to change that now. <laughs> you know. Um, well, and, and little things like uploading to Virus Total is a good example where if you upload a, a file to Virus Total with Virus Total's partner API, I can query that file. And so for a while there, people would get compromised. They'd upload the file to Virus Total, and then there'd be a breach report about them getting breached because they just uploaded the you know, company file or they uploaded private information of virus total. So as a security researcher, we just always have to uh, question and always have to kind of say, okay, what, what is the potential risk of this action or this process or policy? Yeah. So um, do we have any, any questions for Jonathan? Really great talk, Jonathan. I really appreciated that. Um, how you doing? This is uh, Justin Frederick. <clears throat> Hey, Justin, uh, yeah. So there's all these great resources, especially since jumping on LinkedIn, preparing to learn transition from max duty, all that type of stuff. But my question is, is there's a site called uh, cybersec.com, I believe it is, or .org. And it has a lot of good information of uh, how to go about being a uh, instant analyst and responder. But there's so much information, it's hard to really digest of what you actually need to get started um, in regards to certifications. What would be your 
uh, number one uh, certification to get started? Um, well, well, I think the the question kind of still reigns true of, of what do you want to do, right? What what do you want? What do you want to do in cybersecurity? Now, I, I could I'd give you the same answer that probably every teacher gives you, which is like, oh, cyber cyber secure, uh, security plus come to TS security plus is a great start, and it's true. True. It's it's a great start. There's nothing uh, nothing wrong with you know getting that first. Um, your network plus if, if security plus is a little bit too much, you know network plus is a little easier. Um, but but in reality, it, it's it, it's so much more powerful when I see a certification or a a, a, a resume come across where they have uh, four AWS certifications because they're eighty three dollars or eighty nine dollars on sale, and then they also have an A plus certification, then security pluses, and that's just because. Again, you're, you're, it shows me, or it shows you know whoever the hiring manager that I'm following a passion, and this is why I, I'm an expert in this thing. Whereas Security Plus says, you know, hey, I, I, uh, I, I'm going to, I take this certification and do well on it. And not to say that, again, Security Plus is a great certification. There's a great, you can get a job with a Security Plus, but I think you really have to question like, what do I like, or, or what do I want to do? How do I get my hands deep in, in some of those other things? If I go type in cloud. Uh, into security job portals right now, there are a ton, I mean, hundreds of cloud jobs related around AWS, Azure, uh, you know, different cloud infrastructures, digital ocean, because no one out there is expert at it, right? That you can't, it's kind of like the funny job postings you see when they're like 10 years of experience in AWS. Well, AWS really hasn't existed that way for 10 years. Like no, no one has that uh, has that ability or has that capability. And, and AWS has been here for 10 years, but you know, that it's just that uh, that piece of, I think it's always more powerful to follow. Like, here's what I love and I'm going to get into it. I would rather, again, see a GitHub page that had 30 contributions to security tools than see a single certification. Maybe that's just me, but I guarantee I could ask my boss or, uh, you know, another director in the operation center and they would say the same thing where the certifications are great because you're proving that I can go take a test and do well but what it doesn't prove is, is passion it doesn't improve hey I'm gonna really excel at this and I'm gonna be an expert in, in this thing perfect thank you yeah absolutely but but yeah regardless security plus is a great one to start out AWS and Azure both have like fifty dollar exams for the uh, cloud architect and, and different things in Azure they're great ones uh, to start out with, but I think at the end of the day, you, you're just best off figuring out what you like. If that's the red team side, why not take pen test plus first? You don't you you don't have to have for CompT. You don't have to have a number of uh, years of experience or anything like that. I don't believe for that certification. And then you can use that pen test plus as part of your two years of certification to go get OSCP or go get OSCE or something. You know, if if that's what you really love, there's always ways to get to the exam. And, and I mean, even if you don't have this certification, you can still take a lot of those exams. So like CISSP, you can go get a CISSP without having five years of experience. You just can't get the certificate. Um, and that's true for a number of, of things. So again, I mean, you know, I, I wish personally I would have done that when I was at Maryville is taking more certifications. I, I took the class and I said, great, you know, I, I took the CEH course and never went and got my CEH. I, but now I have to reteach myself all of that to go back and actually get the certification. So, uh, you know, take advantage of the classes you're already spending your time on uh, and spend the extra five to 10 hours a week to actually understand that chapter and prepare for a, for a test. One thing I would add um, in that uh, you mentioned a, uh, AWS and Azure. I know Azure, I haven't checked AWS, but I know Azure has um, discounts on cert right now for people um, displaced by COVID uh, and they're 90% off. So they're $15 a, a piece for $15. You could take it, you know, a bunch of times, you know, you, you, you could take it as, as a practice, you know, they're cheaper than the practice exams. Um, yeah. So, you know, look at that, you know, there's a lot of great certs out there. Azure is very highly in demand. Um, and then one of the questions that I had, you mentioned, uh, if you go out to security job boards and typed in cloud, you see a lot of those niche jobs. Um, what can you recommend some of those um, security job boards? I know like Dice is good. Uh, what are some other, what are some good security job boards? So here's my recommendation there. If you're going to randomly throw your resume over on a job board, it's spent the same amount of effort in return from the company, right? <laughs> uh, LinkedIn is a beautiful tool. Find out who the hiring managers are. Find out who's in the operation center. 
send them a connection, send them a message, then throw, send them an email and then throw your, your name in the hat. Because I, I'm telling you guys, I, I'm getting, I mean, we get over 200 applications a month. It, it, and, and it's so difficult to truly do honor to all of those, those applications. But if you're reaching out to me and you say, hey, Jonathan, I just got my AWS cloud security practitioner and associate degree. I really want to get my security plus. Do you have any positions open? I'm immediately almost tabbing your name in, in, in my head of, of, hey, this is probably someone we at least want to have a conversation with. So, so yeah, LinkedIn, it, we, we're spoiled right now with how easy it is to go find who the hiring managers are, go the extra step versus just, I'm going to throw in my application along with the other 200 people. And I really hope that the company reaches out to me, you know, take that extra step and, and, and try to reach out proactively, send emails. Now, I'll say don't, don't, uh, you know, you can do this a right way and a wrong way. Make sure you're always professional. Uh, you know, you're sending PDF versions of your resume and not word versions, you know, little things like that, which hopefully Maryville can, can help you and, and can uh, kind of show you the best way to do some of those things. But, um, and, and I know they can, they have great resources to help with that and in uh, career development and things of that nature. But, but yeah, reach out there. There's nothing keeping you from sending a LinkedIn connection to say, Hey, I just applied or, Hey, I'm going to apply for this position because they very well may reply and say, I looked at your LinkedIn. I don't think you have the qualification for position X, but I think position B would be a great opportunity for you. And I can almost guarantee if, if a hiring manager said that you're going to at least get a first interview with that position B because they've already looked at your LinkedIn. They, they already, you know, saw that you reached out. And so I, I would say job boards, I mean, Ninja jobs, dice is good. LinkedIn has great, you know, job postings, but they're all kind of the same point. People hire people from relationships. They hire people that they think will excel in the position. So prove that to them as, as a you know new student, reach out proactively, post on LinkedIn. So if you're in a CTF, post about that CTF you're going to. If you're doing Security Plus, post that you passed because, and, and I actually did it last night with Dustin York. I've known Dustin York for, I, I don't know if anybody knows him, but a, another teacher in Maryville, I've known him forever. He posted a 10 or 15 kids that graduated, I say kids, people that graduated in the last month. And I, I posted on hey, commenting for reach or whatever. But again, it's, it's great because now all of my connections who may have an internship, may have a communications job are looking at that. But you have to be active in those places. You know, you're marketing yourself. You're selling yourself for position. So uh, yeah, there, there's my recommendation there is, is job boards are great, but it, go in the extra miles and get the job that you actually want. Uh, yeah, Parav, um, we will be posting a recording on YouTube. Uh, we will notify our uh, community via LinkedIn when that gets posted. So just keep an eye out for uh, for that link, and you'll be able to watch this as many times as you want on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much for attending, uh, Jonathan. I really appreciate your time. Uh, we are over time. So um, if anybody else has any questions, would it be all right for them to reach out to you? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I have uh, I have a Maryville email from from teaching of, of you know, just jtalk1 at maryville.edu. Uh, jtalk at speartip.com is my email for, for speartip. Happy, you know, use either one. It doesn't make any difference uh, to me. But but yeah, definitely can uh, can reach out and, uh, you know, hope to maybe have some of you in, in the ISYS 475 class here in, uh, two or three weeks. Yeah. Yep. About to get started there. Yeah. Great. Well, we appreciate everyone for coming by and checking out this talk. Uh, we will be, ha we have another one scheduled in two weeks. So please do check back with us, keep up with us on LinkedIn and all of the social media sites. Um, we look forward to seeing you later and thanks again for coming out. Have a great night. Thanks everyone.